And inside were actually several juvenile king cobras that were dead, um, which it's unfortunate that they were dead, but I'm glad that the agent shuffling through this box with their hands wasn't bitten by one. And they were, they were actually inside nylon socks, but the nylon socks had had holes cut in them. What? Which I can't, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> like, that is a very bizarre story told by Kristen Wiley, who is the director of the Kentucky Reptile Zoo. Of course, Kristen is my guest on today's episode of the podcast. Kristen and her husband, Jim Harrison, are the owner and operators of the Kentucky Reptile Zoo. The Kentucky Reptile Zoo has one of the largest, if not the largest, venom collection of venomous snakes and venomous reptiles in North America. And we discuss everything from what it's like to work at a facility like that, um, what it's like to extract from these animals, some of the most dangerous animals to work with, and and uh, you know everything that surrounds the world of venom. Venom is one of those sort of bizarre parts of our hobby that uh, most people just look at from uh, you know a few steps back, and most of us have a very little experience with it. So I had a lot of fun with this conversation, and, and there's definitely a lot to learn here as well. Enjoy the show. Make sure you go check out animalsathome.ca slash podcast for more information on each individual episode, as well as a few different methods that you can actually support the show. Hi, I'm Dylan, and you're listening to the Animals at Home podcast. All right, well, Kristen, uh, thank you very much for, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having us. Well, you know, one of the things with the podcast I wanted to have is, you know, a wide spectrum of guests with, you know, different levels of exp- expertise and experience. And you and, and Jim have, you know, you're part of a minority, I would say, working with venomous reptiles. And, and it's one of those extremely fascinating sides of the hobby that I think a lot of people just sort of stand back and, and look at without knowing a ton. So I do want to get into that, obviously, because it's, it's, it's incredibly interesting. But maybe we can rewind back a little bit and kind of start or sort of figure out how you got to where you are today. Is were, were animals something that were always involved in, in your childhood, like from, from the beginning? Yeah, but I'm not one of those people who like caught a snake when I was three or four or something. You know, there's you a lot of You don't have that story? <laughs> I don't have that story. Wow. I, I was actually a horse person from a young age, so I've always done that. Um, and I watched, there used to be a show on called Nature. I think it might even still be on. It's on PBS. And my family, oh my gosh, the cat's running across the keyboard. Um, my family <laughs> used to watch that every week. And I think that actually got me interested in kind of wildlife in general. Um, so I wanted to do that, but I, I was not specific to reptiles until I got to college. And then I got interested because I had a, a professor who had a bunch of animals in his lab and uh, he kind of let me hang out and probably be annoying, but um, <laughs> he let me, let me hang around and, uh, and that kind of sparked my interest in reptiles in general. So you made it through your whole childhood without a pet reptile? I did. Yeah. Wow. I didn't get a snake till I was in college. That's incredible. So in college, obviously you started studying uh, reptiles. So what, what was the focus in college? Um, well, that's a good question. The, I went to, to Case uh, Western in Cleveland and uh, I really took like every whole animal biology class that they offered at the time. Uh, it's really more of a molecular type of school. And so um, the focus was just not molecular <laughs> things. Um, I took an animal behavior class. I, I did, took a vertebrate biology class. Uh, the professor I'm talking about, uh, Marty Rosenberg, he did teach a herpetology class that I took. Um, but I just was interested in animals, you know, as they exist in their entirety, not, you know, only in taxonomy or only in, you know, molecular genomics stuff. Um, I'm not smart enough to, to do all that. <laughs> so, you know, it's one of those things that I always ask people is, and most people don't have an answer for it. <laughs> so if you don't have one, it's okay. Where do you think that, that interest and passion for, for animals comes from? Because there's a lot of people that have that same kind of thing where you're just, You'll kind of oh, research. That's a good it. question. Yeah. Do, do you, um, have you thought about that? I think it's a type of empathy. I mean, at least for me personally, it is. I don't think I could do any good taking care of animals if I didn't have empathy for what they're experiencing. And so there's some desire, I think, from for people that enjoy caring for animals in general to make that animal's life better or as good as you can. 
Interesting. That is the probably the best answer I've had to that question. And <laughs> <laughs> so most most people aren't aren't sure because it's one of those almost innate things where you're like, I don't know. I just you know I was a kid and I, I liked animals. So and I wonder if how much of that you started with obviously horses as part of your your animal you know love I would say. And horses are one of those species where the connection between the human and the animal is really really deep. Sure. And, and I, I wonder if if that's where you know that answer kind of come from. You know because you don't necessarily. Yeah feel that empathy as much um, with reptiles, although I'm guessing most people do now, but it's not not the place that you start. But I, I can see where that would come from with uh, horses. That's an interesting point. I mean, that might be true that you do, you know, or with, with any mammal or bird, maybe, you know, you get that kind of more uh, interaction feeling, and then it makes you more aware of, of you know, I, I still don't know how much snakes really care one way or the other about us, but it at least makes you more aware of the possibility for, for something else going on in their head. Um, you know, I do think that snakes, at least some snakes are smarter than people give them credit for in general. Um, but I, I guess, you know, being open to the possibility of that happening may come from experience with animals where it's easier to see it. If mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, that totally makes sense. That, that's, that's interesting. So, and then obviously the zoo came into existence at some point. One, one thing I wasn't sure was, did you and Jim start the zoo from scratch or was that something that was already in existence that you guys kind of acquired? So Jim actually started it um, before I came along. Um, he founded it in 1990 and um, I came uh, in the fall of 1998. So I've been here a long time, but he had a, that period of time before I was here that that, he, that he's the one that started it and, and got it going. Gotcha. Yeah. And and the zoo, obviously, you guys kind of have a world famous venomous c collection, but that's not all that it is, right? You guys have a, quite a large, it's sort of an extensive collection at the zoo. Most of what we have is venomous. Uh, we do have some other things. We probably have, I don't know, 40 or 50 non-venomous snakes and a handful of lizards and turtles. Um, but certainly the focus is the, is the venomous stuff. Right. So the specialization clearly, and you know, where, where does that interest come from? Do you think like, obviously you and Jim both, you know, started at different paths and you both found out, found yourselves interested in, in the venomous species. Do you, do you know why? I was not particularly interested in, in venomous stuff before I came here. <laughs> <laughs> which is bizarre. Um, and uh, I just kind of started working these animals because I was here and I need, you know, they needed to get taken care of. Um, so for me now, I'm interested in them just because they're so darn interesting, I guess. I mean, they're, you know, it's, it's fascinating to think of something that can really be dangerous, but also potentially helpful. Um, and so that's kind of a cool thing. And then, uh, you know, especially like the vipers and, and the rattlesnakes and stuff like those guys are really, their behavior is really interesting to me. Um, so that's, you know, it's easy for me to stay interested in them, but they weren't what I was initially interested in. Uh, for Jim, you know, I think his um, initial interest in snakes just started, he did catch a snake when he was a little kid and scared all his relatives with it at a family <laughs> reunion. And uh, you know, he didn't intentionally scare them. He just thought it was cool and wanted to show the grownups. And then they all freaked out. And he was like, what the heck? How can this little animal be so terrifying? And that's what, that's what kind of sparked his interest. Um, and then I think, you know, like his dad got him a bunch of books and really encouraged him to to learn more about it since it was something he was interested in. And, uh, you know, I can't say why the venomous stuff initially for him was interesting other than I think he also finds the venom aspect fascinating. The idea that, that it can hurt you, but also help you that dichotomy is, is interesting to him. Um, yeah, that it's, makes sense. Oh, it definitely makes sense. And, you know, venom is, it is really bizarre because I, it's almost like almost mythological to a point where 
you know, it's an animal that can inject a toxin into you and it can kill you. And it almost seems like if that didn't exist, it would be part of the fire breathing dragon type story. You know, like it, it's, it's, it's very strange. And I think a lot of people are totally fascinated by it. You know, I, I have boas and a carpet python, but the first thing everybody asks me is, are those venomous? Because you know, these are the regular people that don't know anything about reptiles. And it just attracts people to, it's just such a bizarre trait. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. I, yeah, I mean, you know, you take an animal to a school, we do all kinds of outreach programs and stuff, and I'll be holding a, a king snake or a corn snake or something, and kids are like, oh, is that, they usually say poisonous, unfortunately, but they're like, oh, is that poisonous? And I'm like, well, your first clue is I'm holding it in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm taken to telling them that if they if they see someone holding a venomous snake with their hand, that that person is too stupid to be around and they should go away from them. <laughs> yes, yeah, step back slowly and leave. The kids. <laughs> yeah. So in in terms of a day in the life at the zoo, obviously you guys have a pretty big operation. Like how many how many animals do you have on on the or do you know the number of the animals that you have? Uh, I think we're maybe around seventeen hundred or so now, something like that. Um, I mean, yeah, I don't know exactly. Um, but I think it's in that ballpark at the moment. Yeah. Um, that is, that's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it keeps us busy. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. And then, so a day in the life at the zoo, obviously, um, what does that look like? You guys are milking snakes pretty much on a daily basis. It, yeah, it depends. It depends on the time of year a little bit. So right now is supposed to be our slow time though. It doesn't really feel like it's slowed down much to me, but um, we are, uh, hibernating most of the temperate zone animals right now. So that does take the workload down. Uh, so we spend time, uh, trying to do repairs and improvements as we can. And unfortunately doing paperwork, which is not my forte, but has to be done. Um, uh, budgeting, we're supposed to, we're going to try to, to look at our, get our budget lined out for, for this coming year. And so that kind of stuff happens in the winter. Uh, in the busy time of year, um, we basically have all of the animals are on a schedule uh, that's a rotation of kind of built around their extraction schedule. So things that are extracted from on a regular basis have a schedule and then we work in when we're feeding, cleaning, and doing other tasks to take care of them kind of around that extraction schedule. Um, so there's, and, and we can't deviate too far from it or the whole thing gets messed up. So, um, we really try hard to, to stay on that. And then of course you still have to do outreach programs and deal with customers that are here and, and that sort of thing and try to help the interns. <laughs> right. So, yeah, yeah. That's, that's something that I never really thought of. I guess now that, yeah, you have, you have the, the extractions are part of that, you know, algorithm of things you have to do with each animal. And I know that you guys have uh, people that come in and people are, can actually watch you milk the snakes. Mm -hmm, they can. Yeah, that, that is something that I would find very interesting. Do you guys get nervous? I mean, I'm, I know you, Jim and you have been doing it for so long that I'm sure it's not as uh, nerve wracking as before, but having all these eyes in front, does that give you guys nerves at all? No, I, I don't know. I don't think so. I, I don't know how to answer that we pay so much attention to what the animal is doing that we almost are not thinking about the people. Sure. We usually have uh, an employee and or interns with the people who are kind of interpreting what is happening. And then Jim and either myself or one of our other employees are dealing with the extraction. And so um, the person whose job it is to, to focus on the customers is doing that and then the person whose job it is to focus on the animals is doing that so we really i mean yes the people are there but i don't really i don't think jim's paying it much attention to them unless he chooses to and, and decides to chat with them which sometimes he does but um i don't think he's distracted by them really or nervous about that aspect of it right that makes sense yeah obviously you want to keep focused on what you're doing when you're doing that yeah. <laughs> are there are there any particular species that are very difficult to work with in terms of handling and, and just unpredictability? Yeah. Um, I think it's different in some ways it's different for different people, kind of what they have issues with or what, you know, is harder for them. Um, 
Jim will tell you that the, the snake he thinks is the most difficult to extract from is probably not what you would expect. It's actually the little uh, saw scale vipers in the genus Echis. Wow. The reason for that is they're, they're small, so it's a small target. There's not a lot of leeway or you know, room for error there. And then they also have this really loose skin. And so and I don't know how much you know about them, but their defense mechanism is really interesting. They have a, the keel on the scales on the side of the snake is at a 45 degree angle to the ground. And when they get scared, they rub their scales together and it makes a rasping sound that sounds like a wood saw. So that's why they're called saw scale vipers. Oh, I did not know that. And uh, they're, they're really neat little snakes, but they, they cause a lot of snake bite in the places they're found. They have, there's, they're found throughout most of Northern Africa, uh, through the Arabian Peninsula and into Afghanistan and Pakistan and India and Sri Lanka. They have a big range in the world and they cause a lot of bites because they're very small um, and people don't see them. You know, they're well camouflaged. People are walking around barefoot. Um, but that because they have that loose skin um, due to their defense mechanism, when you go to actually get a hold of them, sometimes they can move around within their own skin. So even if the finger placement is exactly right, the snake can still have some mobility just because its skin is kind of loosely attached. And so um, he thinks those are the most difficult ones to extract from for that reason, just because they're so small and, and you have to be so precise. As right. far as handling things like, you know, cleaning and feeding and stuff, um, you know, anything that's big and fast is, is <laughs> potentially a problem or, or at least, you know, can be difficult from time to time. So, you know, big mambas, big king cobras, sometimes even things like big bothrops can be a handful to deal with. Yeah, it's, you know, it's so weird. There, there's such a difference between, you know, your regular, you know, people obviously in the pet trade, people are handling corn snakes and ball pythons and boas and things like that. But the way an elapid moves is something that is they don't even seem like they're closely related at all. Like these almost seem like a different creature, the way they move and they watch. Yeah, they're very different. I, and, and even among venomous snakes, cobras are definitely different than, you know, rattlesnakes or other vipers or, or things. They're sometimes they're kind of, I, I don't know. They're so quick to change their mind. Like they go left, but then they decide they want to go right. Then they're going up then they're going down. Whereas you know, something like a rattlesnake, if it wants to go left, it's just going to keep trying to go left <laughs> over and over again. Whereas the cobra keeps trying different things, it seems like. And they're, they're so fast. And the, so then the, um, one of the things I thought was really interesting is I reached just, I think maybe a couple of days ago, you had posted some videos or, or someone had posted some videos on the Facebook page of, I think it was you working with an intern, training them how to handle a snake. And well, uh, it was actually uh, one of the keepers at the Columbus Zoo. Oh, right. That's right. That's what it was. And they were coming for just a refresher course, I think, or something like that. Yep. Yep. They yeah. kind of had a period of time where they did, where they weren't keeping a lot of venomous snakes up there, but they're getting some things back. So they were just wanting, yeah, like you say, exactly a refresher course before they had a lot of animals there. That's what I found so interesting was how actual, how, how technical it is to hand, like hook handle the, these animals. I mean, it's something that I've never really thought about before, but listening to you kind of coach her through it, there's so many things to watch out for and there's, it, there's really a technique to it. Yeah. You know, it's interesting teaching people too, or, or having a conversation like that because you realize things that you do that you don't realize you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, things like changing the balance of the snake or, you know, putting the hook in a particular place or not, a lot of that can make a big difference to what the snake does or how easy the maneuver is. But it, until you're trying to explain it to somebody else, you don't really notice all the stuff that you're doing. Yeah, it's almost like all these innate things that you've just been picked up over time that all of a sudden they're, they're kind of the difference between uh, life and death. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes it can be, that's true. I definitely things sometimes on YouTube or, or, you know, just online in general that, that make me cringe that I'm like, why are you doing it that way? But, you know, I don't know, maybe people say the same thing about me too, I guess. So, <laughs> well, you, you see a lot of people free handling venomous snakes and, and that's just, it's, I mean, not good. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's not. Yes. <laughs> So uh, what, once you guys have collected the samples and collected or after you've milked the animals, can you talk a little bit about what you do with the, the venom? Sure. Um, we don't like do much to it here. We uh, typically just lyophilize it here, which is basically freeze drying. 
And uh, occasionally we'll do things like filter it or centrifuge it if the customer requests that. Um, and then uh, it's sent to people at universities or pharmaceutical companies. Most of ours goes towards some sort of biomedical research. Um, so I'm trying to think, maybe roughly half of our customers are overseas, maybe even a little more than that. Uh, so like the most recent venom I sent out was actually to Denmark. And that most of it gets used for anti-venom and as well as, I mean, there's something that some people might not realize is there's a lot of, you know, medication that gets built off of, you know, the research of venom. Um, most of what we provide is not used for anti-venom. We do provide some, I think, finds its way into the anti-venom here in the U.S., but most of it is actually for research purposes. Most foreign countries don't really need us to provide venom from the snakes that they have. They have their own systems for, for, for getting that themselves. Um, but Kate, every once in a while, we've gotten a request from, from an anti-venom manufacturer, but it's usually research. Gotcha. That makes sense. And now, do do you think, as as a someone that's kind of in the public sector in terms of having a venom collection, do you think that the private side should be heavily, um, you know, regulated? I don't think that I am any better at taking care of a venomous snake than anyone else is. But I think if the private sector person wants to have their own anti or have their venomous snakes, they need to have their own anti venom. That is the number one thing, in my opinion, that they should be doing. I think if they don't have their own anti-venom, they shouldn't have the snake. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair rule. And I, how, how long does anti-venom last when, it, when it's created? Is, I'm sure it has an expiry. It does. It's typically three to five years. Oh, okay. So you, you can, um, yeah. I mean, depending on what people want to have, it, it sometimes is expensive. Um, but, you know, South African polyvalent, for example, is something like three hundred and sixty dollars a vial right now. Somewhere between five to ten vials is what you would need to keep, you know, gaboon vipers or mambas or puff adders or any of the African cobras. And uh, you know, three thousand dollars every three years is not that much compared to what people, other people, spend on their hobbies. I mean, you know, one ARS rack is, you know, two thousand dollars or twenty five hundred dollars, something like that. Um, certainly there are animals that cost that much. Um, I mean, I have horses as a hobby and they're very expensive. <laughs> but yes. people hunt and fish and kayak and photography, like a lot of hobbies are expensive in one way or another. In my opinion, that's what anti-venom is. It's a cost of the hobby. Yeah, I know. I totally agree. And I think that, yeah, if you are going to be owning hot snakes, it's definitely something that you should have because it's you're really... It's, you know, if an accident happens, then, then everyone else is going to have to do everything for you sort of thing. And if you have the anti-venom there, you can at least help people out a little bit. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I, I will put this offer out there, and I've, I've put it out on Facebook. If there are venomous keepers who want uh, to know how to get their own anti-venom, I have a PDF made up that says the steps you need to go through. And all they have to do is email me at the zoo, and I will send it to them. And I will answer questions about getting it, at least to the best of my ability. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely put uh, the links to uh, the website and everything in, in the description so people have that because it's super important. And, and you're right, it's just an investment. It's part of the hobby. Yeah, yep, exactly. It's like buying a snake hook or a, a you know, a tank. <laughs> that's right. What are um, what are some of the common questions that the people ask you as they come in? I, I'm sure you guys get tons of questions, but I'm sure a lot of them are the same. Uh, the people that walk <laughs> through the zoo. Yeah, they are. <laughs> uh, people want to know where we get the animals a lot. Um, but I think, you know, most reptile people know that once, once the word is out that you have snakes, then snakes start showing up. <laughs> um, yep. So, you know, getting animals is the easiest part of what we do. Um, we, we trade with other zoos. Uh, we breed a lot here. Uh, we do occasionally get confiscations, though the vast majority of the confiscations we get are uh, Najakuthia, the monocled cobras, um, that we don't want or need. And we just take them because we don't want someone else to get hurt by them, like law enforcement or somebody like that. Um, so the majority of them we get either from zoos or just that we have bred them here for a long time. We do occasionally get things from dealers if we can't get them any other way, though we really don't like taking animals out of the wild. So we'll avoid that unless there's no other option. 
Yeah, that makes sense. That's uh, yeah, it's true that once you get into the hobby, all of a sudden animals just show up. I, they, it doesn't yeah. stop. <laughs> yes, ones you don't want, sick ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And you guys actually, I think, am I right? You guys have a, almost a course that you can teach law enforcement how to handle or how to, you know, be safe around venomous animals. Yeah, we do. Um, we've mostly done it for um, federal fish and wildlife, like at, at ports of entry. So. You know, those guys, they're amazing, by the way. They they can look at a, a tiny little bead on a purse and recognize whether or not it's coral or ivory or, you know, some other controlled uh, animal product, which I just find incredible. Um, but they have to open boxes and they're, you know, sometimes they're done properly and it's declared what the animal is and they just need to verify it. And then sometimes they open something that's supposed to be, you know, a bunch of toys and there's venomous snakes in it. Uh, that actually happened to some officers that we talked to. They uh, had customs opened a box and it was full of the creepiest looking toys you've ever seen in your life. Like these little weird, like um, knockoff characters and stuff, like just totally bizarre little toys mixed in with them. A lot of times when that happens, they're actually smuggling drugs is what they told me. Um, Cause the, the, plastic and stuffed animal stuff makes it hard for the x-ray to work. So that's why they opened the box. And inside were actually several juvenile King Cobras that were dead, um, which it's unfortunate that they were dead, but I'm glad that the agent shuffling through this box with their hands wasn't bitten by one. And they were, they were actually inside nylon socks, but the nylon socks that had holes cut in them what? Which I can't, I have no idea. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like breathe holes? <laughs> big enough for the babies to get out through. Yeah. Oh my I gosh. mean, it just is totally bizarre. Um, so they do have things like that happen occasionally. So, you know, what we're trying to do is just give them some skill set so that if that happens to them, they have some ability to deal with an animal that might suddenly be loose or, you know, partially contained or something like that like half coming out of a sock. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Gosh, I wonder what type of person packed that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to know, probably. No, no definitely not. Um, so you guys must have like a pretty defined protocol when you're, when you're working with the animals, when you're going to do the extractions, I, I assume. Oh, that's a good question. So um, we do have, we have a, um, an official written snake bite protocol on what to do if there's an accident. And then as far as dealing with the animals during the extraction, um, there isn't a written procedure other than like what we do with the venom, like all of that has a written protocol. But uh, for handling the animals, we do have a, a method who's going to be gathering the supplies that are needed. Um, Jim lets us know like each day if he's needs to change the schedule or if he, you know, feels bad for whatever reason and isn't going to extract. So we have like a little discussion about that in the morning. And then, um, our head keeper, Kat and myself, um, will kind of discuss like what, you know, is there anything different we need to do today or that sort of thing. And sometimes there is, sometimes we're, we need to check on an animal that maybe is sick. And so we want to do that you know, after he gets done extracting, so I'll have a plan for it, or maybe we need to, um, you know, make sure those animals eat at a certain time. Um, there are groups of animals that we feed on the same day we extract from them, and so we'll have a plan for how that happens. So um, she and I have a really good system of kind of talking to each other and making a plan whenever we have um, some sort of, you know, different or extra procedure we need to do. Um, we really like to talk out like exactly how we're going to try to do things before we, you know, get in the middle of things with a snake. Um, I, if we're shipping things, you know, packing them up, we'll have a plan. Like we're going to go, you know, here first and we need to set this up in order to put the snakes in the bag or we're going to use this method or that method. So we try to, to kind of know what we're planning on doing before we get in there and try to do it. Um, because the worst thing is you have the snake out and then you realize you don't have some tool you need or something. You don't want to be in that position. So we try to, to do all of that legwork first. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, is it, do you have any fear of becoming maybe complacent because you ha handle these animals so often and you kind of get used to it? Or is the fear of, you know, taking a bite always there so you're always kind of strict with your, the way you handle? 
I mean, you do have to be really aware of getting complacent. Um, I, and I think all of us, if, if there's a day that we're just not feeling it, we feel, you know, like today I'm not going to work anything venomous because I'm frustrated with other personal matters I'm dealing with. So I'm not, I'm not going to even go into an animal room to lo- open anything because I know my brain isn't where it needs to be to pay attention properly. And if you're getting tired or something like that, then it is important to, to really pay attention to that. I think we talk about it enough that we stay aware, but it's always a good reminder to, to not get complacent. It's a good question. I don't think a lot of people realize that that complacency can be a real problem, but it, you're absolutely right about that. Yeah, because it's definitely one of those, I, that's kind of one of the things I thought of is that as you get more comfortable doing those things, you sort of start to take it for granted. So uh, I guess you got to do those sort of self checks every day. Like, how's my mood? Am I focused? Am I thinking about something else? Yep. No, that's exactly right. And, you, and you know, sometimes you have other stressors in your life that are, are out of your control. You know, you're, you have a family member who's sick or there's, you know, whatever it might be. And, you know, you can't necessarily stop those things from happening. And so, you know, if Kat, for example, came to me and said, you know, hey, I, I don't know, my aunt is sick or something and I, I don't feel good today, then I'll give her tasks to do that don't involve a bunch of dangerous animals because it's more important that she not get hurt that day than it is to, you know, we can be behind a day on cleaning or I can do her work or whatever we need to do to adjust for it. We try to be able to be flexible like that if we need to. And luckily snakes, you know, if you feed a snake tomorrow rather than today, they're not going to die, you know? (laughs) Yeah. They're not picky. Yeah. They can be a little flexible that way too, which is kind of nice. So. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's really interesting. Something I had not really thought about too much, but uh, that, that's cool. And ob- obviously, Jim has taken a few bites in his career. Of, he's had a long career of uh, working with venomous animals, and uh, yes, th- yeah. that that's that's a little bit frightening. Yeah. Oh, my cat is knocking things down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you hear noises, that's what it is. Um, you know. People do ask a lot about like, aren't you know, aren't we afraid of the snakes or afraid of getting bitten? And, you know, I don't know what the right word for it is. I mean, absolutely, we don't want to get bitten. We don't, you know, we don't want the, the pain and the risk of getting bitten and the potential, you know, disfigurement or disability that could come from it or, or death. We don't want the hassle, <laughs> which of course it is, you know. Um, we don't want the bad press for the snake. Um, but I don't know if fear is the quite the right word. Like I don't get afraid. I don't think like not the way I'm afraid if, you know, I see a creepy person walking towards me and I feel afraid. I don't feel that way about snakes. I don't, I don't feel that way. You know, I worry about like getting a horrible disease or something and I don't feel that way about snakes either. But what I do feel is uh, an alert like a state of mind of being like, okay, this is important. I need to focus. I need to be present in this moment and pay attention to what's happening. Like I I feel that for sure. And I think that's similar to how Jim feels. Uh, He says he has empty mind when he goes to work with the animals, which means he's uh, doesn't quite mean he's not thinking about anything, but it means he's open to whatever the snake presents him with. He's trying not to have a preconceived idea of how things should go. He's just trying to react to what, is happening at that moment, if that makes sense. No, it, you know, it makes total sense. And I, I actually used to be an athlete. So when I'm hearing you say this, it sounds so similar to what it would take, what my mindset would be go to going into a race where it's, you know, almost this flow state where it's kind of like a meditative state where you just clear your head and you've done the practice already. So it just sort of let this happen. And uh, that's kind of what it reminds me of. It's almost like, yeah, almost like a meditation. Yeah, no, I think that's true. I think, I mean, I'm familiar with the idea of flow too. So I think that's a, that is true. Um, you don't always manage it, you know, no. sometimes you're, you know, like you said, you're distracted or you're thinking about something else or, or whatever. So you don't always get into that state, but I think that's always where you're aiming to be. Um, and certainly on your best days, then you definitely feel that I think. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. I, I, I hadn't really thought of that till just now as you're explaining it. And it's, it's such an interesting addition to the hobby when you're, when you're working with animals of that caliber. And they're, they're all, like, and like we, we talked about the saw scales, like they, they can be small, but they still demand so much respect. Yeah, yeah, they're, 
you know, I think it's, it's interesting too, because I think we, you know, we have affection for them. And so, you know, like we'll see, you know, a, a baby snake or, or just one that we happen to personally like, and we'll, you know, we're making baby talk or, or saying how cute it is or whatever. And, you know, I mean, it's still a venomous snake though. You've got to <laughs> be able to step back from that and be like, okay, well, yes, you know, this King Cobra is adorable, but <laughs> he's also big. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. And so in terms of the, the types of toxins, I know there's, there essentially is like you have, um, neurotoxins, cytotoxins and hemotoxins, uh, I guess in, in terms of the, I know, I know Jim's quote when you, when you say what the, what the worst is when he's the worst snake bite is the the snake that just bit you. But is, <laughs> is there a, is there a, a type of toxin that is the most worrying when you're, if you were to get, take a bite? Well, I don't know if I would say the, the, a particular toxin, but there's definitely snakes that I think are worse. Um, you know, certainly like both wraps that can cause a lot of tissue damage and, um, you know, a lot of kind of long-term effects. Those are definitely the ones that I'm the most leery of. I mean, something like Echis would be that in that category, I think as well. Um, you know, you do need to be aware with things that are highly neurotoxic, that those can be very fast acting. And so like we do use a pressure bandage technique for those. Um, but that has to be something that's carefully conceived and implemented. Um, so I think it's more, not so much thinking that like one is, is worse or better, but thinking about the ways that they're different and how to be prepared for each of those. I think we definitely consider that. Right. That makes sense. And, you know, and one of the things I've heard Jim talk about this as well as I, I just read uh, Dr. Brian Fry's book, Venom Doc. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the weird reactions that happen when you get bit that aren't, you know, painful or, you know, Dr. Fry talks about almost being high. I can't remember what, what, um, what snake it was, but he said it was just this, he said he lived a whole life or an eternity or something. And I know Jim had talked about a, a snake that made his, uh, a bite that made his vision good. <laughs> like yeah. it all of a sudden has yeah. corrected his vision. So that's very bizarre. Yeah. I mean, that stuff is weird. Um, I don't think Jim or I have experienced any sort of, you know, euphoric feeling. Um, <laughs> but uh, he has had a couple things like that where he had like the vision one um, for sure is probably the most striking one that he's had. He's had some other kind of odd symptoms um, at times, like weird muscle contractions and things, which are not unheard of, but um, that certainly are, are kind of weird to go through, I guess. Um, I don't know. I think snake bite is such a rare occurrence in the United States and especially, you know, exotic snake bite that we're still learning about it all the time. And in other countries where unfortunately it isn't uncommon, a lot of times the record keeping or medical uh, infrastructure in those places is lacking. And so we still are learning in those situations as well, even though the sample sizes may be large, they may be, you know, difficult to create follow ups and things like that. So, you know, some of those symptoms that happen might not be as rare as we think they are. It's just that they're not well recorded. Sure. Yeah, that's, yeah. The, and I mean, I guess that's the one thing about living in North America, and I live in Canada, so there's no venomous snake bites here. Uh, I guess we're kind of fortunate in that because I, um, right. but I think you were just in India. Is that right? And you were doing yeah. a, a presentation. I know India is obviously one of those places where they, I don't know if they have the most snake bites in the world, but they're definitely up there. Yeah, they're, they have very high incidence and probably underreported uh, due to the kind of medical infrastructure situation there. Um, yeah, it's a real problem. I mean, it's good. Um, you may be aware of the WHO just, I think last year, gave snake bite a status of a neglected tropical disease, which uh, will serve to focus more resources and attention on to snake bite, which is a good thing because there really are a lot of people suffering um, in other parts of the world, you know, not here in North America, but, but in places where, you know, they really have very limited resources and it's really sad. Um, these people are just trying to make a living or, or, you know, farm their land or something like that. And, and they end up with this horrible disfiguring injury. And, you know, as much as I like snakes, I, I don't enjoy seeing people suffer like that. And I certainly, um, you know, hope that we can get some better solutions uh, for, for those folks. Yeah. And, and, and it's, I know, in, especially in India and I think Africa as well, there's lots of sort of ancient medical procedures that really have no grounds in science that a lot of these people that 
get bit end up using and it, you know, it's obviously detrimental to their health. It is, though I think it's important for us in the West to kind of understand how those things come about because um, I, I had this explained to me by Leslie Boyer um, and she did a great job of, of kind of helping me to understand this situation. So imagine if you're in a, a place in, in rural India or rural Africa, um, then the nearest uh, city to you may be several hours away and the nearest person with a vehicle to you might be one guy in your village who has a motorcycle and nobody else has any sort of means of transportation that's reliable or nearby. But every village has some sort of wise dude, right? They've got somebody who's kind of like the village elder or the person that everybody goes to for advice, or maybe they are an official traditional healer of some sort. And so when anyone, whenever anybody has a problem, they go to those people. And if you get a snake bite or an injury, you go to that person and that guy's going to try to help you because that's what his job is or that's what he's expected to do. And sometimes if the bite isn't severe, you get better because you weren't going to die or have a severe reaction anyway. So that reinforces the fact that the traditional medicine helps. If the bite is severe, then the traditional guy typically realizes that and says, oh my gosh, we got to get this person out of here. And they start coordinating, finding the one dude who has a motorcycle or the one guy with a truck or whatever. They figure out how to get it there. You know, it's been several hours now. Um, they find that maybe you as the snake bite victim ride on the back of a motorcycle for four or six hours to get to the nearest hospital. That doesn't sound like fun to me. And then when you get there, maybe they have antivenom, maybe they don't. Maybe if they do, they request six or eight or 12 months salary in order to pay for it. And your family's scrambling and trying to get all the money they have and selling their, you know, three goats that they own or whatever it is. By this time, it's 12 or 24 or 48 hours after the bite. So the antivenom efficacy is going to be much less. And many of those people have bad outcomes because the bite was bad and because they had delayed treatment. But the appearance to them is that they went to the hospital and it didn't work. So if you're one of those people in those situations, the logical thing is not to go to the hospital first because that's not what the evidence shows. So even though we, you know, with our science background and our education can look at this situation and say, why are they going to these traditional healers? That's a terrible decision. From their perspective, it's not. And it's a vicious cycle because, you know, they get reinforced for doing the wrong thing sometimes. And then they get you know, dissuaded from doing the right thing because so often the bite is so severe or the time lapse has been so long that the outcome is going to be bad no matter what. So, I, you know, there are groups trying to work on solving that problem, but it, it is, I think it's important for, for those of us who are, you know, privileged to live in this, you know, wealthy society to understand that, that these are not stupid people. Um, they're not, you know, backwards, they're making the best decision that they have with the resources that are available to them. Yeah, that's really a good way of putting it. You know, it's they're collecting this observational data and it's telling them what to do. And I guess the point would be if you or I were in that situation, we would make the same the same call if we if we live there, because that's that's the data that you're getting. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. So I guess that's the hopefully the with the new sort of influx of money that's coming in, maybe they can start to solve some of that problem. I mean, it's a definitely a tricky um, problem to solve because it's it's hard. You can't stop snakes from biting people. Right, right. And a lot of the solutions that that seem really obvious to us, like you know, wearing shoes, for example. Um, you know, if you give somebody a pair of shoes in in parts of Africa, they're just going to sell those for money. Right. And you think, well, why wouldn't they just keep them and wear them? But you know, the the few dollars that they're going to get might be more helpful than you know wearing the shoe on the off chance that they're going to get bit by a snake someday. Right. Yeah. It's definitely a very complex issue. It's not it is. simple. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. That's why it's still a problem. And so, so when you were in India, I think you gave a, you gave a talk at that, um, at the convention. Can you talk a little bit about what, what you had talked about? It, it wasn't anything real high tech. I was basically just kind of describing what we do um, from the perspective of how we can be a resource to people who are doing research on venom, on snakes, um, on, on snake bite, uh, just kind of the various ways in which we try to serve the research community. So, so it wasn't anything real, real high tech or anything. 
Uh, it's pretty interesting. I'm sure it was a pretty interesting convention, though. It seemed like there was a lot of really kind of uh, interesting presentations. There were. The, many of them were over my head. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, there were some really good talks. There was actually a couple of really interesting talks on um, not related to snakes on uh, movement of ancient humans that I actually really enjoyed that were um, kind of complicated, but also really interesting. Oh, that is interesting. And that somehow tied in with the, with the snakes or was it, I guess it, w- it was more, more than just snake. That was just one yeah, section. There, there was a, it was basically like a small snake bite symposium, which is what I was there for, but it was nested within this larger uh, biotech conference. So the larger meeting had things um, about venoms, but also had a lot of different topics that, that people were speaking on as well. Interesting. And so actually, one of the other things I was going to ask you is, have you guys had any issues with people developing an allergy to, to the venom? I know that's, I, I hear that all the time with people who work with elapids end up developing yeah. like a, almost like an asthma or some, something. Yeah, I'm allergic to spitting cobras. Um, and I have some problem with, with just cobras in general with their uric acid waste. Um, yeah, I get like the full on, like, really essentially have to continuously blow my nose, my eyes run. It's just miserable. Um, so we like cat, our, our head keeper, she takes care of the spitters for the most part, because if I, if they even spray around me, I just immediately start having a reaction. Um, it's really annoying. <laughs> yeah. Cause you just developed that over the years. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe from the dried venom that we try to be careful not to be too exposed to that. Um, maybe from just being around them and getting their poop on me and that sort of stuff, you know, it's hard to say exactly. Everybody's immune system is a little bit different and what triggers it is a little bit different. So it's hard to know, but, but yeah, I definitely have issues with them. Yeah. That's such a, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it sounds exactly like what happens with me with cats. (laughs) Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's yeah. So I guess it, you know, because venom is a weird thing where people kind of, it's not, it has to be injected into you. The molecules are so large. That's the only place where it's toxin or where it's toxic. So I guess if you're inhaling the powder, it's not really affecting you like it would a venom, but eventually your body might develop a immune response. Yeah. Well, and keep in mind, there are some smaller molecules in the venom that are probably not, you know, of, of consequence when it's injected, but perhaps are allergenic. Um, So it might not be that I'm allergic to something that would hurt me if I were bitten, you know, like to a neurotoxin, for example, it might be that I'm allergic to some other component in there that, you know, we don't even know what it does for the snake, but it's, it's there. Right. Yeah. Cause there's quite a lot in those, uh, (laughs) when they do inject, there's a lot in there. Yep. Yep. So in terms of, uh, I I know people can support the zoo and they can come and obviously visit the zoo as support, but you guys collect donations as well. And I think, uh, Amazon smile. We do. Yep. We're, we're on Amazon smile. Um, you know, you can, you can donate through Facebook or PayPal. Uh, the, the Facebook page is just Kentucky Reptile Zoo. So it's also pretty easy to find. Um, and, the the smile thing on Amazon is actually, that's a really nice thing. I mean, you just, instead of going to amazon.com, you go to smile.amazon.com and you can choose whatever charity you would like to donate to. Um, I think everybody should do that, whether or not, you know, I hope they choose to donate to us, but if not really, you know, your charity of choice, why not? It doesn't cost anything and it, Amazon will do it every time you buy something from Amazon. There's really no reason not to go there ever, I don't think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And those, for those listening that aren't sure how that works, it's just a commission goes to the charity and you're, they're not paying any extra for goods or whatever they're buying. It's just a little piece right. goes to the yeah. charity. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, what's the website? Uh, the website is kyreptilezoo.org. And if someone was interested in coming to check out the physical location? So we are open officially um, from the first weekend in March to the last weekend in November. It's Friday through Sunday only in the spring and the fall. And then between Labor Day or Memorial Day and Labor Day, we're open every day. Uh, if people want to visit on a day that we're not officially open, we usually can accommodate that. We're happy to take appointments to let people in, uh, especially reptile people, because they're fun to talk to anyway. Um, But people would need to contact us through email or Facebook um, to make an appointment for that. Awesome. Well, that, that's awesome. Uh, I really appreciate you joining me today because it was a very interesting topic. You know, venom is one of those strange things that not a lot of people know about. So it's kind of a cool side to the hobby. Oh, uh, yeah, no problem. I appreciate you being interested. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. 
thank you for listening to another episode of the Animals at Home podcast. I do hope you enjoyed that episode. Again, if you're looking for any information on this individual episode, make sure you check out animalsathome.ca slash podcast and you'll find the show notes there. The links are also in the description for iTunes or your favorite podcasting app as well as YouTube. If you want to support the show, definitely subscribe on YouTube and iTunes. That helps me out a ton. Share the content if you are listening and you really enjoy it and you have friends or family or other people in the hobby that you think will enjoy the show. Share it with them. Let them know that you found this podcast and and you think that they'd like to to listen to it. That helps me so much. And if you do want to buy a shirt, an Animals at Home t-shirt or a sweater, you can go to animalsathome.ca, click on the shop button, and for every shirt that gets sold, $5 does get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. Talk to you later.